So it was great talking about the uh, the, ju the, the grab bag and that. So yeah, just if you just w wouldn't mind, just tell me a bit about um, how you kind of you know got started on music and then how you got how you got uh, into the video game scene. Well, um, how I got started on music, um, I kind of wanted to be a band director all along when I was in high school. Um, I went to the University of Texas at Austin with that intent, um, only managed to get in two years worth of study uh, before I ran out of uh, both financial and parental support, unfortunately. Oh, okay. Uh, and, and I wound up going to work for the Internal Revenue Service. I think that's the same thing as the revenue commissioners over in Ireland. Right, yeah, yeah. And uh, that's where I met my wife. Well, I actually met my wife at uh, University of Texas, and we both went to work for the IRS at the same time. Gotcha. Um, I kept working on music, though. Uh, kept playing around with it, uh, doing arrangements, still hoping to one day be this big star in the marching band world. Never, tur never turned out that way. Okay. But... I kept on learning as much as I could about writing music and when the chance presented itself I got myself into computers um, got my first computer in 1992 a uh, 8286 12 megahertz with a <laughs> whopping yeah with a whopping two mega two megabytes of RAM um, just a monster of a machine for the time right yeah yeah and uh, got on to the bulletin board scene and started up writing a report that got distributed pretty widely through the Fidonet network at the time which was uh, the precursor to uh, what we're using now, the internet, right. uh, it was the bulletin board internet interconnection. Um, what I was writing was something called the hack report, which was uh, a report on files that had been uploaded to bulletin board systems that had been hacked or had been uh, tampered with. Mm -hmm. Or had been had been uploaded, where were actually Trojan horses or virus-infected files, okay. things like that. Just things that system operators of the bulletin board systems did not want to keep on their BBSs. Gotcha. And just so happens that Joe Sigler, who was the online representative for 3D Realms or Apogee Software, as it was known at that time. Uh, placed a report in uh, one of the issues of the hack report right. and that was the beginning of everything I uh, got to know him that way uh, also got to know Steve Corella one of the other uh, members of uh, Apogee software uh, sort of through that direction through all of the Fidonet communications mm -hmm. and once I mentioned I kind of wish that I had a chance to work in technical support with them and word made it up to the higher-ups at uh, Apogee and one thing led to another and next thing I knew it I was leading the Internal Revenue Service and headed to the tech support room at Apogee so, uh... And I wound up there, and eventually uh, Tom Hall and the crew that was working on Rise of the Triad moved in to uh, the building as well. Mm -hmm. And I talked to some of the developers and 
told them I was getting into music and was playing around with some of the stuff that I had, one of them gave me their copy of a sequencer program called Cakewalk. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. I think it was version 3.0 for Windows, wow. one of the really early versions. Um, I messed with that. Uh, I think it was uh, Jim Docterman. Uh, uh, who gave me that. I'm probably doing him a disservice by misremembering him, misremembering his first name, uh, which is terrible. Uh, my, mem <laughs> my memory, my memory is going. I'm a, I'm technically a, uh, senile at age 54 here. So, <laughs> no. <laughs> Not at all. uh, but, um, uh, anyway, uh, I played around with that and brought up an, ar an arrangement of uh, Chopin's Death March to Tom Hall, let him play it, and it wasn't the best thing, but it marked the beginning of me uh, bombing oh, Mark Dockerman. I've right. just been reminded by my ah. wife, Mark Dockerman. Gotcha. Oh, for crying out loud, I can't believe I didn't remember that. <laughs> <It's all> um, <laughs> uh, but I, it, that arrangement marked the beginning of me carpet bombing Tom Hall with MIDI songs, MIDI gotcha. files. And eventually, um, I got pulled aside by uh, Scott and George, Scott Miller and uh, George Broussard, and was asked if I wanted to write the soundtrack for Rise of the Triad. Right. On one condition, well, t two conditions. One, I only had six weeks to do it. And two... <laughs> Two, I had to work my tech support job at the same time. Oh, wow. I, I could come up, I, I could work at home, which meant that I was really working, working by myself, but then during lunch periods of the other tech support guys, I had to come up to the office, work the tech line, uh, answer the phones, and then when everybody had had their lunch, I could go back home and work on my own. So... Wow. For six weeks, I did that. And I'd bring songs up during lunch, give them to Tom. Um, I wrote like crazy. I brought up 36 songs during six weeks' time. Talk about a crush. That's, that's that's amazing. That's why the songs are so varied in Rise of the Triad. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was literally throwing everything at him. Just everything <laughs> that I could think of. Right. So, Duke Nukem 3D, I had much more time to work on. So that's <laughs> why that soundtrack is a bit more coherent. <laughs> Yeah, because uh, I was gonna ask you about the Rise of the Child music because it's, I mean, it, like I, I love, I love the music from Rise of the Child, and again, it's your, yourself and Bobby uh, doing the music, but like, yeah, the tracks are so varied, you know, it, you know, some of them have this kind of like new wave kind of punk, and then some of them have mm -hmm. this, like, you know, this Latin kind of jazz big band arrangements. Like, you know, I, I know you, you uploaded uh, the Havana Smooth onto your YouTube, and yeah, it was just. No, it's just, it's just such a different, different soundtrack, you know. I pulled from I, I pulled inspiration from every source that I could find. It I pulled Havana Smooth and uh, some other jazz from my love of drum and bugle core, uh, right? Drum drum core. Um, I pulled inspiration for other stuff like the uh, the cool song from uh, Frankie Goes to Hollywood, the Welcome to the Pleasure Dome song. Oh, yes. I, 
I pulled music from Philip Glass. I pulled from uh, uh, um, from the Iron Foundry, uh, a bit of uh, mo modernist uh, Russian uh, pre pre Soviet music. <laughs> Um, just everything that I could think of, I would go and do homages to. Uh, I, I had to. I had no no choice. There wasn't enough time. <laughs> right, right. Where is it? And like we, so obviously you were kind of given. I mean, you were doing your own thing. You were just you were literally just churning out songs. Um, were you? Were they? Did they go to you and like, oh yeah, we need we need something that sounds like this. Um, because I know Rides of Child was supposed to be a sequel to uh, The Wolfenstein. That was the original intent. Right. Um, they, they changed that. Um, I don't know what portion of the project they changed it in. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it was originally intended to be that. But they got away from it. Right. Uh, they... They gave me suggestions, um, and I went with some of them. Um, they didn't give me too many suggestions. They, uh, I, I begged for some. Um, oh, okay. Like what? Didn't get, didn't get a whole lot. Um, it was really, j I after I would bring songs up, they would give me feedback. That was the biggest deal. Uh, Tom would give me a lot of, a lot of good feedback. Mm -hmm. um, especially the biggest bit of feedback I remember is on the uh, Havana Smooth. If you remember the yeah. one bit where the trumpets and trombones. Um, Alternate from different speakers. Bam, 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 bam. Da da. Big. Right. That was his, yeah, yeah. that was his yeah. idea to do that. No way! Wow. That was his idea. I've I followed through with that. Wow. I mean, it's it's it, it's a lot. I mean, like that. Like I played all these games when I was younger, and the music always kind of stood out to me. But the one thing I loved about well, actually, your compositions in general, but the one thing I loved about Havana Smooth was all the the, the solos that you, that are in it, like the trombone solo and, and the flute solo and stuff. Um, it's really cool, you, and you never really hear it in video game music, you know, like these kind of jazz solos, and you sequence them really nicely. You know, you have all the, like, the 32 note, you know, drops in the legato, you know, and it kind of goes, boom, you know, to the next mm -hmm. notes. It sounds really cool. Like. Yeah, that's, yeah. That bit. Da -da 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 yes, that's the one. That's exactly it. That is uh, taken from, um, inspired by a drum corps solo from uh, somebody who did that on uh, a drum and bugle corps called the Guardsmen um, in 1980. I think. Okay. Yeah, I, I got real specific with my my references on some of them, and that was he was playing a playing a baritone bugle. Okay. So that's it's really more of a baritone bugle than it is a trombone, uh, but it's 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 a trombone patch that I did use for that. Right. But uh, um, I had. I did make it sound like he had valves, so you could say it's a valve trombone. Right, okay. I guess. Yeah, it's um it's a great soundtrack and again, you and Bobby, you know, worked on that and the songs again are all nice and varied and but like that that game is it's it's kinda it doesn't take itself too seriously. Kind of the same with Duke, right. you know. It's it's really fun, and like you you play the game, and like you just you're jumping on trampolines over to different sections, and it's just it's <laughs> it's just really enjoyable, and the music yeah. kind of just enhances that because it's just it's just so out there, you know. <laughs> yeah, any any game that's got a song in it called Fish Polka can't be taken completely seriously. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 That one was intended to um, 
intended to let people know if you were cheating or not. I mean, if it plays at the warp screen, and right, yeah, because it's to let everybody in the room know that you're that you're cheating. Yeah, it is, yeah. yeah, this big <laughs> obnoxious polka. Um, <laughs> just nice and loud. Uh, we've got elevator music, uh, literal elevator music for when you're stuck in an elevator. Right, that's uh, correct, um, yeah. <laughs> and there's elevator music in Duke Nukem as well. Um, so I just have have this love of elevator music. I don't know why. It's for, I, I take that from the scene in uh, the Blues <laughs> Brothers when the Jake and Elwood are riding up uh, to the top floor of the building to pay the uh, pay the tax assessment on uh, the orphanage that they grew up in at the end of the movie. Right. And uh, J they're, they're sitting there listening to the girl from Ipanema just <laughs> while the the storm of uh, police and army troops are down there trying to get get after them it, just a hilarious scene and uh, just inspired me to go with elevator music anytime the a lift is used so <laughs> Yeah, it's it's funny you mention that because I did um I did a composer's play with um the the System Shock composer um uh, Greg Lopiccolo and he he did the same he got elevator music for the elevator and put it in the game and yeah it just kind of adds this it's just it, it's silly but it kind of adds something to the game you know gotta have some silliness can't yeah. take it completely seriously uh, oh, absolutely I I totally agree <laughs> I mean all the, I mean most of the games from the nineties anyway are all kind of silly. <laughs> in their own little way, mm -hmm. you know. Well, yeah. Well, look at you, what what you're dealing with here. You're sitting in front of a computer and you're playing with pixels. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's not exactly real world stuff. You know. So, just take it a little bit less than seriously, and you're gonna have fun. <laughs> right. So yeah, let's talk about the um the music for Duke. Um, what like what was your like. I know that obviously when they rise of try that I, I didn't know that you just had a lot of tunes raked out. With Duke was it a different story? Did um did the guys want you to do something specific? For uh which the original or for the twentieth anniversary? Uh well for the original and then for the anniversary actually if you want to answer both, that'd be cool. Well, for the original that was another case of carpet bombing. Um <laughs> okay. I wasn't I wasn't supposed to be writing music for it either because after I got finished with uh, Rise of the Triad I went back into the tech support room. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, I, the Duke guys had moved in to the building as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I went down to where they were working and started bringing MIDI files into them. Right. Um, sort of surreptitiously. And uh, I'd bring them things like uh, Gotham and Stalker and Grab Bag and one or two other files that I can't remember right off the bat. Mm -hmm. um, they got to know my stuff little by little, and eventually I was let in and started being allowed to write some of the songs. Uh, by 1996, I managed to convince them that I was doing them better in, I'd be doing them better writing music than I would be in the tech room. So they right. let, they let me get out and uh, they promoted me to music and sound director by 1996. Um, so, um, it was just that part was a little bit slower um with the original duke nukem 3d levels i bobby had wrote written uh more of the songs than i had with the first three episodes 
Um, episode four, I wrote all of those, so that put me over the top. Um, and then episode five, I wrote all of those as well. Gotcha. Um, the inspirations for the songs came from the levels themselves. I managed to have that luxury nice. uh, this time. Um, was able to look at what was going on. Uh, also, look at uh, what what the levels were named, uh, and talk with the level designers, mm -hmm. and get that feedback. So, for example, the level that had um, uh, the Exxon Valdez in it, that got uh, a song called Floghorn, right. which had, you know, I... I'm huge into puns for my song names. Uh, I'm a I, I'm a champion punster. I have to let that out. Oh, uh, right, nice. Yeah. There's there's a competition in Austin called the O. Henry uh, Pun Off World Championships, <laughs> held every year in May, and I'm a three-time winner. No way. Three-time world champion. <laughs> That's uh, amazing. Yeah, they have two competitions that are part of it. One of them is just a back, a back and forth. Uh, one person says a pun, and then another, you know, the other person reacts to it, and they just go on until one person takes too many seconds to respond. I won that. I won that one once, and then they have another competition where you come up with a pun for that's prepared. 90 seconds long I won that one twice so uh, that's amazing. yeah um, that is that's more difficult I think because you've got to you've got the you've got the possibility that somebody might have come up with what you've written but and gets up there and says it before you do your routine and that Gosh. happened to me once um, <laughs> So that that was very embarrassing, very embarrassing. But uh, um, I mean, can imagine it's very difficult, though. You know, trying to come up with puns, it's not easy, like especially on the spot. Yeah, the some people say the first part of the competition is, is harder. Um, mm. Just thinking of them on the fly, and yeah, but I've only won that one once, and I'll admit that one's not easy to win. Um, <laughs> But uh, either way, I've used I use puns in a lot of my song titles um, for the Pirates of the Caribbean level. Uh, my song title there was Calypso Facto. Right. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, that just another example, and <laughs> the you go through any any of my other song titles, you're bound to find more. Oh, um, I'm going to have to check them out now and see if I can figure something <laughs> out. <laughs> Stalker was one of my favorites of all time. Yeah. If not, if not the favorite out of uh, the Duke tracks. Um, it's, I went back and listened to an old version and that one um, just uh, actually had a little bit faster um, bit when it came to the, the brass hits um, in an old original copy of it. Uh, oh, okay. Instead of instead of boom bam, boom bam, boom, it had them coming in at double time, boom. Bum, boom, boom, bum, boom, boom, ba -dum, ba -bum, boom, ba -dum. It had them right. coming in like that. I, apparently, that one didn't make it past what I call the George filter, which is George <laughs> Broussard <absurd>. saying <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha, okay. So, uh, I pared that down and that made it through. Um, but, yeah, that one was one of my all-time favorites uh, and it when you go through and 
put that with the Hollywood Holocaust level, they just fit perfectly. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, if you call that up and go ahead and play through it, you'll see what I'm talking about. It's another one that's got a lot of cover versions. Yeah. And this is your, so this is your favorite of, of all the Duke songs? One of them, yeah, I, I think it's about the, the favorite. There were, there's a couple in the, one or two in the new songs that are, that I like. But out of all the originals, I think this is my top one. Yeah, I love, I love all the square, square synths and stuff from the general MIDI. That one's yeah. Like, I love that. Like, it's, just, it's so cool, like, you know. Yeah, I, I had a. That was one of the things I liked about it, um, about writing back then. I had a limited set of tools, right. it, or a limited set of instruments, and that made things not really easy, but it restricted what I could do and. Um, it kept me from going all over the place, right. if you know, if yeah. you get what I'm saying. It kept me from going wild. It, I didn't have to worry about, well, what, um, what VST am I going to load today out of the 20 million that I've got saved yeah. on my hard drive. Right. Um, I, I had a Roland sound canvas SC88. Uh, I couldn't use the GS uh, sound canvas uh, only sounds on it because the Apogee sound system that Jim Doshe had written, um, and if, by the way, there's a bit of a pun there too, if you'll take the first three letters off of the uh, Apogee sound system, um, ASS is what we called it, um, uh, no way. It it didn't support support the sysx commands that you needed in order to put uh, a Roland synthesizer into GS mode. Oh, so we couldn't. Okay. Yeah, so we couldn't put it. it. Couldn't use any of the special sounds that you could get on a Roland synth. Gotcha. Uh, which is why we didn't get any free hardware from Roland. But anyway, uh, um, but I still loved using the thing, uh, using a Roland Rap 10. I used that as well. Um, see, we had a the the Apogee sound system. I collaborated with Jim on that. He got he wrote some support in for things that I asked um, one of the things I asked for was a way to make one MIDI file support a number of different sound cards because gotcha. um, the, the different sound cards back then none of them were compatible with each other in terms of the way a, a song would sound mm -hmm. you, yeah. Yeah. like the Insonic cards didn't sound like the sound blaster cards which didn't sound like the Roland cards or you know you get the drift here yeah, the, gotcha, yeah. and of, of course the uh, the cards that used uh, FM synthesis didn't sound like anything else so um, and George didn't want to use multiple MIDI files so we had to keep everything within one MIDI file. Gotcha. So I, I got Jim to write in support for special MIDI commands. And um, these were ones that weren't specified in the general MIDI pa uh, command set. Um, we, you can still find this out on the, the, net, the internet nowadays. Uh, we call it the E-MIDI uh, 
eMIDI commands, and that's why if you play one of the old MIDI files, you won't get uh, the same thing that you'll get in the game. Right. Um, it'll sound different because there's all kinds of junk in there that will make the the, the file sound different than it gotcha. did in the game. Um, but that's it, why it asks when you load up the game originally or the old ver the old game when you load it up, it asks you what your sound card is, and from there on, it'll play only. Uh, the tracks that are written for your sound card. Right. And uh, I did some pretty heavy duty hardware swapping in order to get it right because I'd go through, write the original song, and once I was finished with it, I'd swap out the sound card and then rewrite it in that same file. Um, wow adding extra tracks in the file for the sound card if it needed it mm -hmm. um, uh, add extra notes sometimes um, especially with the FM stuff I'd have to put in special patch changes uh, special commands here and there just to make it sound acceptable on everybody's <laughs> on everybody's yeah. computer yeah and it worked yeah. it worked well um, I, I had no idea you put you guys put so much effort into you know um making sure that everybody gets kind of a, a good sounding song you know whatever hardware they, they had you know yeah tender loving care that's what it, it yeah. was yeah no, i mean we we wanted this thing to be right and we took the time wow. to make it come out right so, I mean, I even learned, I even went in and learned to program in C uh, so that I could write utilities for uh, Gravis ultrasound cards. Um, I had, Gravis ultrasounds came in four different configurations for uh, the amount of RAM that they had. Mm -hmm. uh, anywhere from 256k up to a meg in RAM and I had to analyze my MIDI files uh, to see how much RAM they were eating so in terms of how many patches they were loading onto the card so I'd have I'd have to either back off on the patches or I could sometimes add additional patches it, we went to that extent to make sure that the game was the best possible game that the user could could get and i think that really did help make the game the hit that it was i mean i, I, I had this conversation with with other composers you know and it's it's like a lot like that's what you're saying TLC a lot of these games they I mean, there was I mean there was a, there were small teams but God they worked their you know their asses off you know to to really you know to put their love into the game and and it, it shows you know yeah I understand um, and like and you were and you were talking about the the um, like your limitations on 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 the hardware and what you could do. That's that's something I, I I brought up with with other composers as well, and they and they said exactly the same thing as you. You know, you're not you're not dwelling on like you have so many synths nowadays. Your your VSTs, your contact players that have all these amazing third party sounds. You just you're limited to you know to whatever a hundred and so instruments, and then that, that was it. And you just you worked with it, you know. Exactly. Yeah. It's. It, I mean, back then, I if I had the chance to use what I've got today, I wouldn't do it. I'm only recently kind of getting into this. I mean, well, like early, like mid 2000s. So um, yeah, I never even thought about how the limitations could change your composition approach, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we're kind of, I'm, well, I'm kinda, we're kind of lucky now that we have all these amazing synths and stuff, but at the same time, yeah, does it, does it change? I mean, obviously it does change how you write music and that. Um, but it, it's interesting. I mean, 
maybe sometime I should, I should go back to just the general MIDI and, and start writing some songs and, and see how it goes, you know? Right. Uh, that's what I... That's pretty close to what I do now. I, I still have a SC88, uh, a Roland Sound Canvas. Oh, yeah. This It's the SC88 Pro. Uh, and that's what I'll usually start a song with nowadays mm -hmm. a lot of my drum tracks still use the SC88 Pro right uh, okay and that's I'm still writing music the same way that I did back then I I don't perform it in with a keyboard or with a drum pad or anything like that I mouse it in uh, one note at a time no way okay mouse it in um, I go in and plop it down on the piano roll view uh, using cakewalk just like mm -hmm. I did back then uh, yeah, it's it, cakewalk's gone through a lot of revisions yeah. it turned into sonar for a while right. now it's back to being called cakewalk cakewalk by band lab now right that's, that's correct yeah it's free as well it free and being improved uh being upgraded too um it's a very nice piece of software and it does everything that i need it to do so why change <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah i've moved on to where i'm capable of messing with the multitude of synthesizers and stuff i've i've got complete ultimate uh I do have a bunch of other VSTs uh, along with that. Uh, I've got Addictive Drummer 2, um, mm -hmm. Addictive Drums 2, I'm sorry. Um, and I do use that on occasion, especially when I'm writing a heavy metal track, because it's got really good heavy metal drums. Right. However, when I do go in and use it, I don't always use the patterns the way that they come, uh, pre-configured patterns. I'll go in and edit the patterns. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. uh, take out a snare here and there, um, sometimes clear out the entire hi-hat track and, or put in my own hi-hat track. Mm -hmm. um, other times, like I was saying, I'll start a track completely with mousing in my own uh, drum track and then build on top of that. Gotcha. Uh, but the, the, way I, the way I write um, is just with making sure that it's nice and neat and tight. Uh, I keep I, I edit down to the edit list um, level. Uh, I go in and uh, edit the velocities of each note. Um, I mean, as far down as um, the durations of each note, uh, sometimes positioning them uh, at little offsets, um, one pattern can can take a long time to put together. Sure. Um, yeah, because like I'll, I've like I've, cause I, you know I started off writing midis and that, and I'd I'd often check you know the midis from the nineties and like this is when I was starting off and I was always curious how you know th different you know composers either had a kind of tighter sound or a looser sound you know and i go to your stuff and it was all really pristine like the you know it's i mean it, it, it's evident that you click it in because everything's so perfect and but like it has this nice tight sound and you can hear it even on this song with your with the snares and stuff mm -hmm. um, oh, well thank you yeah that's great uh well i i tried um i one of the things that helped me there was uh, I played percussion in high school. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was, when I was in marching band, that was one of the things. Um, when I got into high school, um, my first 
first day there, I, I was originally a bass clarinet player in junior high school. Okay. Uh, but uh, I had I'd been given a bassoon by my uncle on my mother's side. He had found it in a rental property that he owned um, that he'd had to evict the, the people from. They'd left it behind and he wound up giving it to me. I'd taken a couple of lessons on it to try and learn to play the thing. Nice. And the band director at this new school that I went to got wind of me learning how to play it. And he needed bassoon players more than he needed bass clarinet players. The problem is bassoon players don't march in marching band because of the double reed that you've got. Right, okay, um, yeah. uh, if you march with the double reed and you bump your arm into somebody else who's marching, there goes the double reed up through the roof of your mouth. Oh, that's why. Wow. Yeah, that's hap that actually has happened before, and that's, you know, that just doesn't happen nowadays. They don't right. do that. So, um, the band director put me on percussion the very first day of, of, uh, that I, of school. He told me to go grab a pair of cymbals and that I was going to be playing bassoon from now on instead of bass clarinet. So, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, from that point on, I started learning percussion for marching season. And by the time I graduated, I was playing a, a, a two and a half octave marimba uh, that you carry around on your shoulders. Right. And for marching season and playing solos uh, out there on the field. Um, and I actually did march in a drum and bugle corps one year, um, played uh, the glockenspiel, bells. Lovely, yeah, and, they're, they're a lot nice instrument. Yeah, and wrote drum parts, wrote... Uh, other uh, mallet parts and even wrote uh, brass parts for one song that our drum and bugle corps did. Um, but I had to watch what the drummers did and saw how they did their technique and one of the things they did was they have a weak left hand as somebody's called it. Um, okay. The right hand right hand's always stronger than the left hand so you know when you hear the stroke uh, on the downbeat that's always going to be a little bit stronger than the next stroke which is coming from the left hand sure yeah yeah and that's that's why the velocity of beat one on a 16th note is i'll usually set that at 100 and then 95 for the next stroke or 90 for the next stroke 95 for stroke number three and then gotcha. 90 for stroke number four and there's my set of 16th notes right there and it sounds perfectly natural yeah, yeah. It's, and, and it makes such a difference it makes such a, a huge difference you know and there's your geek lesson for the day right there <laughs> <laughs> no it's cool because like i i actually i started off playing drums and my family are all jazz musicians so i kind of started off you know, mess around on drums and then kind of learn how to play piano because I want to be able to write music, you know? So I, 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 could, definitely, I could definitely hear your, your percussion influences um, in, your, in your music, which is cool. Like, cause it's, often, it's often neglected, the percussion side of music, you know? Right, right. Um, and it's something that I'd, I'd like to see, nice percussion, you know, nice beats and, you know, it's, yeah, it's something that's just neglected, but uh, and it's something yeah. I, I I notice in your in, in your midis. Did, did you separate all the, the different drum parts like your bass drum, snares, and cymbals? Sometimes. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I would. Sometimes I'd group them together on one staff. Um, uh, on some tracks, I'd have to do it because I, well, if I'm using a, a VST 
or something like that. On on the original stuff, I'd do it just um, just for convenience sake because I would run uh, commands against it, some of the cakewalk commands to do scaling or um, offsets, things like that. Gotcha. Um, but with the more recent stuff, uh, sometimes I'd have to separate them out because I do different treatments, you know, different compression. Um, sometimes the JJP uh, plugins from Waves, I use those on uh, some of the drums, um, specifically on the snare and bass right. and, and toms and not quite so much on the cymbals and the hi-hats. Um, I have a problem with, personally, with my hi-hats tending to stick out a little bit. Um, so I have to rein them in at times. And other, t other times I have a little problem with my toms not quite coming through, so I have to boost them and the JJP Plugins from Waves help me get those boosted out a bit. Gotcha. So, yeah, the, I'll separate those out onto separate staves or use a different uh, different plugin instru uh, instance uh, to get gotcha. that going the way I need it. This is what's the name of this one? Uh, Robo Creep, is it? Oh, Robo Creeping. Yeah, I love the brass. It's great. The French horns. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're so nice. It's just that nice, that nice... I don't know, it's like a close... It sounds like a sus, but I'm not sure... That's a... That's a that sounds like a tritone. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Da -da -da. Yes, bom, yeah. Bom, exactly. Bom. Yeah. That one is just inspired by the level that it was being played on um just a creepy feel to it yeah it's definitely a creepy level <laughs> yeah yeah i absolutely love that track it's great that was a fun one to put together. Uh, that one gets its inspiration from a news program, believe it or not. Um, there, <laughs> no way! There's a program that used to air on uh, KPRC Channel 2 in Houston um, called The Eyes of Texas. Um, <laughs> and they had the greatest intro music of any news program and you take that and mix it with the ice battle music from uh, Star Wars uh, The Empire Strikes Back take those two mix them together and this is what you come up with oh really is that where that's where you got the inspiration from that's the inspiration for it those two <laughs> songs sort of a mashup Yeah, it's so frantic, isn't it? Very frantic, yeah. Yeah, it's great. This is one of those that I had to really push to get it through the the George filter. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's so funny. Anytime I hear that that brass, that MIDI brass section um, instrument, I, I immediately think, oh, Lee Jackson. <laughs> 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 it's, it's so like cause you, you, know, you hear it in Rise of Tribe, but like and Duke as well. But it's like it's so. Uh, it's anytime it's like yeah, that's it. That's 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 so Lee Jackson. I I can't believe I've made a stereotype out of myself with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing. It's definitely a good thing. <laughs> I, I just 
that's that's another part of my concert band, uh, marching band, right. uh, self tra- self training. Yeah, um, gotcha. I I love the heavy hits of the brass section, you know, the trumpets, the trombones. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I, and there we go with the tubas coming in, the right. tubas and the low brass. Because like this song's like very, it's seriously orchestrated. Like, and all the parts, they're not all playing at the same time. They're all like call and answer, which is really cool. Like, call and response, should I say? Were you involved at all with uh, Duke Newton Forever? Um, like with the music and that? Did you, ha- were you like, were you in the process of writing songs? Um, that weren't ever finished, or I was. Um, I experimented, but I didn't. Like you said, they weren't ever completed. Okay. Um, because with that, I tried to really stick to doing inspiration from the levels themselves, and the levels never really got finished. Sure, yeah. By the time that I was there.